Hello, everyone, and welcome to Placing Faces, the show where we sit down with some of the most influential casting directors in all of Hollywood and across the entertainment spectrum. I'm your host, Charlie Chappell, and today we sit down with casting director and producer Alexa Fogel. Alexa has had a really incredible career she said she just kind of fell into. Can you imagine falling into work like NYPD Blue, Oz, The Wire, Generation Kill, Treme, True Detective, Show Me a Hero, Banshee, Ozark, Pose, The Deuce, and Atlanta? And that's not even all of them. No kidding. Alexa has worked extremely hard throughout her casting career, constantly juggling multiple projects while simultaneously producing films. She is a veritable badass, and I couldn't have been happier to talk with her. Being that she's on the East Coast and I'm on the West, we chatted over my 6 a.m. coffee and her mid-morning break, and I have so many more follow-ups now. My brain was operating a bit slower than usual, but suffice it to say that she gives a lot of really great advice, even if she doesn't think so. I think you'll really like this one. I enjoyed it even more the second time I listened to it. So drive safe, work out hard, and I hope that you learn as much as I did. The best place to start is at the beginning. So where is it that you come from and how did you get here? Uh, how did I get into casting? Yes, ma'am. I studied uh, directing in college. I was going to be a theater director. Um, and when I got out of school, I worked in an off, off-Broadway theater that no longer exists as the assistant to the artistic director. And the casting director left in the middle of a season. And I took it on without really knowing what I was doing. But what I had studied, that sort of skill set of understanding material and working with actors, um, was kind of right in my wheelhouse. So without knowing what I had prepared myself for, I actually had studied for what I ended up doing. Um, I finished that season and then I went on to do um, work at a theater called Manhattan Punchline. Mm -hmm. And then I worked doing regional theater for a couple of years in a casting office in New York, which I think ultimately prepared me for everything because you have deadlines that are absolute. Um, working on mean? lots of different I mean, when you, a regional theater company mm -hmm. has four or five plays that they do a season and those dates never change. So the actors okay. have to be cast, play has to go up when it has to go up, mm -hmm. come down when it has to come down. So if you're doing two or three productions at the same time for, you know, a theater company in Philadelphia and Alaska and, um, you know, Rochester, then you get really good and knowledgeable about working on deadlines and with different kinds of material, you know, long days turning into night and fences at the same time. Mm -hmm. And juggling those two productions, juggling everything, because it seems like you've done that all your career. You've had, but that I think is the thing that was my best training ground. Yeah. So just yeah. having that basis in was is it a is it a fast paced environment in that where you have a quick turnaround, or is it just the fact that there's multiple things that kind of stacked up that you're having to work on simultaneously? Well, it's also it's about the actors. It's about people who can do different kinds of theater and and understanding okay. how to how to fill those roles and who's going to go out of town for this amount of time and uh you know different ages different capacities for different kinds of plays you know you have to know all of that so my theater training was really important and being incredibly organized it's just good okay. hard work just putting down and getting the hard work done yeah yeah um, so I've done a, a fair amount of research on you. You came from a classical music family, which I feel like comes with a whole lot of lessons of exactly what you just said, hard work. And I always love talking to people about their early influences because I think your early influences are the ones that kind of build up your core of, of your taste. And I'm curious what are some, what some of the early influences for you in your life that build up your tastes? Um, I mean, I think it's twofold. It's true. I did grow up in a classical music family and I was sort of surrounded by people, you know, practicing all the time and working out the same kind of phrase. My uncle was a pianist and, you know, if we were in the same house, um, you work on the same phrase over and over and over again until you get it right. Mm -hmm. And musicians practice every day for hours every day. Um, and I never thought about that. It's just something that when you're a little kid gets, you, you just hear it. You don't even notice it. Um, I think that I loved 
I loved movies and plays. I just did. And I grew up in a creative environment, although my father was a lawyer and very hardworking. Um, you know, Sidney Poitier was my favorite actor from the time I was about 10 years old. I saw Lilies of the Field. Uh, okay, starting off early with Lilies of the Field at 10. Yeah. <laughs> and that I just, I think I just loved good acting. And I wanted to be around it. And I didn't know there was anything like casting. So I thought I wanted to be a director. All right. That's an interesting point. Because one of the things that I've found over the course of doing this show is nobody really knows early on that there's somebody who helps find this cast outside of the director or outside of the producers. Um, and I'm curious, when did you realize outside, was it, was it just in your theater experience that jumping into the casting director kind of clicked with you or was it at a later point that you kind of bought in and were like, yes, this is, this is where I fit. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I've never made a decision about my career. Okay. My whole career has been an accident. (laughs) It's a very great accident that you've had. Maybe. I mean, you know, so far so good. Um, no, the only decision I had ever made, and I really, when I was about 12, is I thought I wanted to direct plays. And the rest of it's all been kind of a happy accident. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I never decided to be a casting director. It just happened. Okay. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess taking that, how did it happen? Because, I mean, a couple projects in, you, you did a couple things and then landed on NYPD Blue. How well, did you... I worked in the theater for some time before I did anything in television or film. Okay. I mean, I was really young. I was 24 when I started. And then I worked for about a year, maybe a little bit more. Um, when I, uh, not intentionally, but left the theater, I worked for Donna Isaacson doing some New York, I guess, associate work on some films. And then I went temporarily to work at ABC during a pilot season and ended up staying and running that department, which is how NYPD Blue happened. Okay. Because when I stayed, I said I wanted to actually do casting. Hmm. And then I, you know, again, I hadn't made a decision, but I was there for almost nine years. Now, with with the project of NYPD Blue... Uh, according to at least the uh, IMDb career that you've had. (laughs) Uh, um, I'm a bit ignorant on this because you worked with Junie Lowry Johnson, who is the credited casting director, and you were casting in New York. I'm curious, especially in the 90s, because things have kind of changed. The world has gotten a lot smaller since the 90s. I assume she was in L.A. and you were in New York. Correct. Correct. Were you considered the location casting director, even though things were being shot in New York? They were shot in L.A., and then they would come to New York to do... The um, exteriors and stuff. Right. So, no, we did it together. We cast the show together. Okay. We we pulled actors from both places. I think that probably that hadn't been really done before, but because the show was set in New York, we needed, and they cared about it feeling authentic, Mm -hmm. um, we decided which roles we would both work on and show them from both places. Okay. So when a new episode would come in, you guys would break that down together. And uh, I'm curious about the process of all this for, it was fairly seamless. I mean, we we got on well, we had, we knew, we both knew what we were doing. I mean, we didn't have to, you know, knock it about much. We both knew what we were doing and we, liked working together Mm -hmm. so it wasn't it wasn't a complicated process okay um so you said you worked for nine years with abc how instrumental was that to what it is that you do now because you've come uh, i mean a very long way from there and and done such incredible work especially for the premium tv channels the hbo stuff and the cinemax things um, and even more lately, the, the stuff you've done for FX, but I'm curious how formative the, that time that, you know, uh, I couldn't really research of those nine years that you were around to becoming the casting director that you are now. I don't know if it was, um, I mean, I think the thing that it, 
uh, solidified or taught me most was really just about, um, you know, having, you have to have unbelievable organizational skills to work at that pace. So it taught me how to be a general, but you have to work when you have a job like that, you, you don't get to choose what you're working on. You have to work on everything the network does. So you, you know, you learn how to organize your time in an extraordinary way. But I think ultimately, uh, I wanted to be able to, you know, work on less things. And if I was lucky enough, choose what I was working on. So Oz was the first thing I did really by myself fully in television. Which kind of changed the landscape of television a bit too, I think. Um, well, specific- that's Tom. You know. Yeah. He, he, you know, that's, that's HBO's first hour, hour long dramatic series. Um, and I think it's the predecessor to a lot of really great television nowadays, um, including all the OTT stuff. Um, so <clears throat> we'll actually just jump right into Oz um, and we'll go with the softballs first and build on that. But how did you become attached to that project and what was the collaboration worked, like? I had worked with Tom before on mm-hmm. um, a couple things while I was at ABC. And I don't know if I left specifically because I knew Oz was coming around. I, I had planned on leaving that job about six months earlier and um, – they asked me to stay to sort of get them through a transitional period, which I did. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but Tom and I had a great relationship, and I knew I wanted to keep working with him. And um, it was a wonderful collaboration. I mean, he is – we have similar backgrounds. He's also a theater person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's a New York person. He loves actors. He goes to the theater. So that's – you know, the great thing about casting Oz is that every single kind of actor you can think of from, you know, Elaine Stritch to some rappers who didn't have any acting experience, everybody was on it. Mm-hmm. Every single kind of human being was on that show. And that's that was the joy of it. And was it that way on the page? Yeah, I always refer to it as a Jacobean soap opera, you know. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure Tom would feel that way but uh, <laughs> it was complex and um you know intense and also at times funny and you know yeah it was absolutely on the page yeah you know if it's not on the page then it's for me it's most of the stuff that i work on it's on the page you've worked on some extremely well written uh things for sure um so when this one it came along and, and you got the pilot to this. How tuned in were y'all about how far these people were going to have to be able to go uh, from that point? Because, I mean, you can guess it's a prison. There's a lot of things that are going to be going on. There's a lot of like craziness that happens in this show and a lot of boundaries that are pushed, especially being the first hour drama at HBO. Did you know how much you would be pushing early on? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think Tom knew what he wanted to do with Lee's character from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. He had that sort of mapped out and um, the Schillinger character and I can't remember all the characters' names and, and, you know, the role that Harold's character was going to play as a kind of Greek chorus and yeah, I think I think I mean I didn't know the storyline for everybody, but I understood what we were trying to create. Okay. And yes, is the answer. <laughs> okay. In another one of your interviews, uh, which we'll post a link to in the show notes, you talked, albeit briefly, about the idea of the long game. And you specifically were talking about Michael K. Williams auditioning for Oz, not getting it, and then coming back around with the wire. I've been out here about a decade now. And the longer I'm here, the more attrition plays. People run out. The you know they're they're struggling, not booking. They're broke. They're on their last leg. Is there any advice that you could give to actors out there who are in that situation? I can't really. You know, it's not my place to give advice. You know, I can only speak to my own experience mm-hmm. and in my career. And I'm and I'm not talking about the industry in terms of that, whatever interview you're referring to, I'm talking about the craft of casting. Okay. So in my experience in 
in my business in New York and, you know, LA in so much as it figures in, um, it, it absolutely is about the long game in terms of so many actors because actors, most, many and most the actors that, um, I, you know, partner with for lack of a better term, whether in the audition room or in terms of working on something that I work on are good. And so they're going to be good at more than one thing over time. So if you do a good audition and you don't get the role, eventually you, you know, you're going to be right for something. One hopes. I mean, I have, this happens to me so frequently. Um, you know, it just happened on something that I'm working on that an actor who didn't get something a year ago on a project that I worked on with a very good writer who I work with a lot. Um, just two days ago, got a great part with that same, you know, writer producer. I mean, that's, that's the, that's partly what you're doing is if you do good work, it comes around Mm -hmm. and that's what we're all doing. We're all trying to people these stories with the right people at the right time. Mm -hmm. So if it's not the right time, it may be the right time later. It's all building blocks. Yeah, like one of the people who you cast in Oz was Dean Winters. Um, And out there, if you're listening, you don't know, you may not know his name, but you've certainly seen him. Um, One thing I noticed is you cast him way back when in an episode of NYPD Blue. Was he somebody that you had remembered from before and maybe even seen in between? Um. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry, Dean's not a good example because um, <laughs> Dean and Lee were uh, people that Tom wrote those roles for. Really? So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not responsible for that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Are there any examples of, of people that you saw early and you were like, okay, you're you're maybe not right for this role, but... It happens all the time. Okay. I mean, it, it's just countless examples it's, of it. It's that. I mean, that, that is actually my job. My job yeah. is to remember, um, you know, part of what a casting director does when you get a project and you have a character is you, you, you actively think of other characters that you've worked on that you might go back and look at those lists of auditions or lists that you made and think about who might be right from then to bring in now. That's part of the job. Mm-hmm. Um, and Interesting. You do it all the time. So I've never heard it put quite that way, where just process-wise, so you're going back and, and in your mind thinking, okay, this character is similar to that character that I cast in that thing. So I brought in this guy. He was great. That so, is- so I brought in so-and-so. Mm-hmm. Let me go back and see what else I brought him in for and look at those lists and see if there may be five people from those projects that I should be seeing for this as well. Okay. Okay. It's instinct. It's instinctual. I mean, you know, when you look at the list, who's right to bring in, but if you don't look at the list, you might miss it. Mm -hmm. So I have to imagine as with a lot of casting directors that I've spoken with, you have a steel trap of a mind when it comes to, people is that true and have you like have you is there some sort of superpower that you guys have to remember all of these people because it's a lot there there is a ton that you guys well and i have this nifty little thing called a computer Uh (laughs) uh-huh i mean you know i do think it's remarkable the things that we used to have to just remember but you know, these days we have organizational tools that can help us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, you know, you find ways, I'm sure every casting director has a different method, but you find different ways to organize information so that it's there and available to you and you can go back to it, you know, look things up in whatever way you want to, Mm -hmm. to jog your memory. But yes, um, yeah, I think we're all pretty good at that. Yeah. Um, so uh, to to the point of all of the things that we're trying to talk about with the Ardius, Ardios Awards, uh, we'll jump into that a little bit. Um, you're up for three nominations for the Ardios this year, so congratulations for that. Um, you're certainly not new to the Ardios. Um, 
I mean, you've been nominated for 25 or 26. I kind of lost wow, count. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, and you've won 10, not to mention, you know, multiple primetime Emmys. Um, this year, you're up for in television pilot and first season Ozark. Uh, you're also competing with yourself in that category with The Deuce. And in television series comedy, you're up for Atlanta. And it's a pretty good showing. It's not bad. Uh <laughs> to be up there. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk with you is yesterday I sat down with Amanda Lanker Doyle and uh, Chrissy Fiorelli, um, who are, they've gotten their second nomination at the RDO. So I wanted to kind of see a bit of a juxtaposition of somebody who's, I mean, your first nom and win was in 94 for NYPD Blue. Um, <laughs> Dating me, you're dating me. <laughs> we can cut that out. If this you is like. an ageist industry. <laughs> um, I'm curious what those early years were like for you getting that recognition for NYPD Blue and what it kind of did for your career. Um, I mean, who can remember back that far? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of it does anything for your career, to be honest. Uh, I think that it was meaningful to me because that show was the first time I was really allowed to be working on something with Junie, you know, outside of being an executive to, to really work on it as a casting director singularly and to be recognized for that. Well, that had never happened before. And that meant the world to me to be mm -hmm. part of a creative team. But I don't, I don't know that any of this, uh, you know, affects our careers I, I'm, I just don't know the answer to that okay now because you've been a part of the RDS for multiple times uh, because of your work are there bits and pieces of advice maybe you could give to casting directors that are trying to come on the up and up right now maybe they've cast one small project or a couple small projects and really have yet to land that uh that thing that can can help them build their career. Is there any advice for those people early on in their careers? I know, again, I don't think that I'm in a position to give anyone advice because so much of what happened to me was about, listen, I worked really hard. I didn't do anything else for, you know, my 30s and most of my 40s. Um, and... When I had an opportunity to work on anything that I thought was great writing, I killed myself to do it. That was all I cared about. But I think people's priorities can all be different. Mm -hmm. I, I was, um, you know, so much of what's happened to me really has been an accident. I would never have chosen, you know, the some of the things that kind of happened, and I'm lucky that they did. So I don't think I'm in a position to give advice. Well, but I, I and I, I do appreciate humble, but I do think that the point you make about hard work is a, a point of advice that I'm not sure many people get pounded into them enough of how hard you do have to work and how hard other people around you are working. So you have to work that much harder to really stand out, to really shine. Well, but you know, I think there's a there's a tricky part. The flip side of that, I think, too, is that casting directors can also be taken advantage of in this industry, and that's something I defend with an enormous amount of gusto. So it's tricky. You know, I I came from a background, I came out of the theater, I wanted to work on really, really good writing that was meaningful to me with certain kinds of writers. But some of it fell in my lap. I mean, the reason that I ended up working with David Simon on the wire was because he came out of the Tom Fontana camp and Nina Noble, who's his partner came out of the Tom Fontana camp. And I've said this before, I'm pretty sure they didn't know another casting director <laughs> and the rest is history. But you know, um, I mean, I, I've never said that to Nina, but I don't think that, I think they just called me because that was the, Oh, we know a casting director, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, switching gears for just a moment, um, you also produce with your company Beach Hill Films, which I'm fascinated by, uh, 
because I'm seeing more and more casting directors kind of getting into that side of things. Uh, one of the things that I found with you online was um, a, a panel bit that you were on at South by Southwest in 2011, I guess. And you're asked this question basically about the idea of somebody wanting to make a movie and then coming to you to attach talent. And you said it seems more like producing, um, which I totally agree with. I think that when you're, when you're attaching people, when you're putting uh, a project together, you should be considered a producer. And I'm curious why that isn't more of a concept being embraced by the industry in general or even casting directors saying, okay, yeah, I'll come onto your project. I'll help you uh, attach these people but I want a producer credit and I want to help you make this movie. I th well, I think more casting directors do do that now. They do? Okay. Um, I think they try and get a back end and maybe take a producing credit. I mean, a lot of casting directors may not want to be producers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had that aspiration when I left ABC. I left because I wanted to make other things. I didn't just want to be a casting director. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's specific to my own experience. Um, so I, I do think that that's become a little bit more of the norm when it comes to attaching people. And I just don't do it because as a producer, that's part of my job on my producing projects. Although I do less and less fictional things these days anyway. Are you, so you're just heading more towards the nonfiction story? Well, well? We, I, we just finished a documentary we've been working on for almost five years. So that took up a lot of space and yeah. time. Documentaries do that. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, so you've been producing and EPing on projects since Life Breath in 1997. Is that right? Oh, I guess so. And, and you've done a film every couple of years, every three years or so? Since then, um, I'm curious how you juggle producing these things and what your role as a producer entails with Beach Hill. Well, I mean, from a mental health standpoint, the way that you juggle it is, you know, I couldn't do I couldn't do one of these professions on their own. You know, producing is really difficult and never ending and casting has deadlines all the time. So they work well together. You know, one sort of feeds the other and informationally one feeds the other, you know, it takes a long time to put a, a film together and having deadlines for casting helps you feel like you're getting something done. And, um, you know, I function like any other producer does, except that I'm not juggling a million producing projects at the same time. I think that's the real difference is I have to focus on what I'm trying to get done. Mm -hmm. um, because as you say, every two or three years, you know, my casting career can support me. My yeah. producing career definitely can't. What gets you excited about working on a project in a producerial I think if I if I add value to it, if I can really see that I'm, you know, that I can help bring it to life in a way that, you know, it should be brought to life. Mm -hmm. If I really add something to it. So one of those films that you produced um, that I had seen was Run Fat Boy Run, um, directed by David Schwimmer, written by Michael Ian Black and Simon Pegg, starring Simon Pegg, Tandy Newton, Hank Azaria, Dylan Moran. What was it about that one in particular that you saw that you could bring to that? I mean, that, like mo most of the fictional stuff that have come to light in my case is because I end up, you know, finding something from an actor who has a piece of material because I spend most of my time with actors. I mean, in that case, that piece was originally set in New York. And we were having, okay. yeah, and we were having a really hard time getting it made. And then very, very quickly, um, the production company and Schwimmer found a way to attach Simon, do a crazy rewrite, and shoot it in London. I mean, it happened so fast. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just have no control over, you know, you, you go from zero to 60 and it's happening after two years of trying to get it made. Mm -hmm. But that was because of my relationship with Michael. Michael Ian Black. Mm -hmm. So he had brought that script to you? 
I don't remember the initial thing. I mean, we knew each other and it may have been something like that. We had another thing of his that we were trying to get made that never happened. Um, but yeah, these are fluid relationships Yeah, with performers. And by fluid relationships, you mean it's it's not just that initial meeting. It's it's about that long term. It's about establishing relationships. It's about working with the people that you enjoy working with and building projects together. Yeah, absolutely. So another one of your projects that I'm very excited to talk about is Ozark, um, created by Bill Dubuque and Mark Williams, starring Jason Bateman, Laura Linney, Julia Garner, Sophia Hublitz. Hublitz? Is that how you mm-hmm. say your name? I think so. Um, and a whole lot of faces that you're going to be seeing for years and years to come. Uh, it's cast by yourself alongside of Tara Feldstein and Chase Paris in Atlanta. Um, so I'm from the Ozarks, and I think you guys nailed the feeling of a lot of these different types of people um, because there is a very specific... There's, a, there's an Appalachian kind of influence, but a Midwestern influence. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about the pilot. When you receive... A script, what is the first thing you do in your process outside of read the script? I mean, the most important thing at that stage is to talk to the person who person or people who are making it. And in that case, it's Chris Mundy and Jason. Um, Chris is the writer, showrunner, and he's the person that I work you know, with Jason at that stage, but then ongoing most closely with. Mm -hmm. when it comes to casting and he and I have a real mind meld and uh, you know it's really his voice that um is on the page and he and Jason and I have a great casting relationship um so you know we talk about it we talk it through and and um then just begin the process well what what are those conversations like what are you are you discussing each and every character are you focusing on you sitting down and reading through it. I'm, I'm curious more about the process here. Um, I mean, look, I've been doing this for a long time. When it comes to the lead um, primary characters, when a piece is well-written, I think that, you know, part of my uh, 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 important component of what I do is to understand writing and what it's asking of me as a casting director. Mm. Writing and acting are the two things that I'm supposed to understand best. So no, we don't, you know, read it. We talk about my assumptions about the character, their assumptions about the character. And hopefully, and in this case, um, they're pretty clearly aligned. Um, if I have questions about, um, anything to do with, you know, characteristics or age or relationships, then they answer them. And then, you know, we just get going. I, Putting out the breakdowns, doing auditions, posting the auditions for them that I, of the people I want them to see, and then discussing them. Or in the case where it's a character where we wouldn't be seeing people, making a list, checking those availabilities, and then getting the, that list with those people's materials in front of them. Okay. So over the course of uh, the interviews that I've seen you in and, and just today... I know you, it seems like you're a huge believer in the process and, and about putting the work in, um, as an actor, I know what it takes for me to be prepared. And if I'm not, if I've done it, um, you know, it may not always book me the role, but, or have the outcome that I'd like, but I know I have to put the work in and I'm hoping that you could maybe expand a little bit on what it means to put the work in as a casting director. Um, what, what are some of the things that, you know, when I say work, oftentimes it's the tedium. What are the things that you're going to have to maybe drag yourself through to get to the things that you really enjoy? Me? Yeah. I don't find it tedious. I mean, I like the process. Great. Um, you know, it's, it's, if I'm doing my job well, then the people that I'm deciding should come into the room to, you know, audition for a role should all be there. So mm-hmm. it's not tedious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes dealing with some of the organizational work. I mean, look, it, all, all jobs can be um, tiring at times, but the part where, you know, I'm doing the work with uh, the actors or the writers, that part's never uninteresting. Mm-hmm. 
So another one of the projects you worked on, uh, season one of True Detective, uh, another kind of landscape changing project uh, created by Nick Pizzolato. First season directed by Carrie Fukunaga. You've got Michelle Monaghan, Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson. I know they were attached before, right? Matthew and Woody before Correct. you came onto the project. Correct. Um, and I think that there was this magic in season one that they've been trying to capture ever since. And the cast that you built around these two guys was was really solid. Um, and I'm curious, to my memory, even though it wasn't that long ago, this was 2014 when it came out, it was one of the first TV series where proper movie stars came out to, to make this thing. Um, like before then, you know, if you were a movie star and you came and did TV, it said it was a sign that things weren't great for you, that you were kind of on the down. Um, and I'm curious how aware you all were about that at the time and if it changed anything about the way that you went about finding these other actors and having those two people you know attached if it was easier to find people that way um i didn't think about it to be honest i mean you can't think that way when you're casting something because you know the roles are what they are and the actors are still going to be paid what they're paid according to the budget and the schedule is still the schedule and um, I think, again, your job is to people this community with the most correct and authentic for the world um, actors that you can find. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tried to do. I mean, you know, at, before they shot it, you don't have any idea if those guys were going to be great. I mean, I didn't. I didn't think about it one way or the other. I just knew that the rest of it had to serve the writing. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so another one, because you've worked, especially early on career stuff with a lot of the premium channels, HBO, Cinemax, lately you've done a couple with FX. Uh, and I'm curious if there are differences in, in these models and what different considerations you have to make within those models that either maybe tie your hands or give you a certain freedom that you wouldn't have otherwise. You know, it's a good question. When I started working at HBO, you know, we had complete and total freedom because there wasn't anybody there. And and I would say that I still do have that. There are just a lot more people to talk to. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I love working at FX. It's an incredibly creative place. Everybody who works there is so completely committed to the creativity and the work. And... Um, you know, it has, it's slightly different DNA, but it's, you know, I think I'm really fortunate. I'm working at places where people are really intelligent, really well read, really understand history and literature and how all of these pieces they're trying to make fit into a kind of landscape that, you know, it can sort of go on. So uh, they are a little bit different, but I think the thing they have in common are these creative, smart people. Mm-hmm. So in particular, you're like, so one of the shows that you're working with on FX is Pose, um, which created by Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, and Steve Cannells? Can, yeah, Cannells. Ah, uh, great. And it's, I, I, I've seen the pilot. Uh, it's incredible. Um, I wanted to watch more and more and more of it. It's the largest cast of transgender actors to be starring as series regulars in a scripted show. Um, and one of the things that I caught in the first episode is one of the characters has this really beautiful line that realness is what it's all about, being able to fit into the straight white world to embody the American dream. Isn't that what you're trying to do, dance yourself into that world of acceptability? And I kind of want to use that as a jumping off point uh, into the conversation that's being had right now about diversity in casting and what maybe some of the guidelines or understandings, conversations that you guys had early on in putting Pose together um, with consideration of that conversation that's being had right now? We, I didn't, didn't have any conversations about diversity. We just talked about the piece. And it was really just with Ryan. Um, okay. I mean, you know, we knew what we were trying to do, which was... And the, the pose that you see is a little bit different than the original script that I worked on in that there were there are a few characters on the show that weren't in the script that be, 
based on people that we saw in the audition um, process. Ryan created those roles for them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, because that's Ryan. Um, so, you know, I, I, there's, there's no conversation about, you know, diversity. There's conversation about finding these women and, and, and the boys, um, Mm -hmm. the dancer, uh, which is what was in the original script who had been thrown out of his home for being gay. Mm -hmm. And that's what I set out to do. So, you know, and it was an extraordinary and wonderful experience. I loved every minute of it. It's great. No, I mean, it wasn't about diversity per se. It was about you know, honoring the piece by finding, you know, these people who could play these characters. Sure. Which is, I think, as it should be, the the idea of who is going to best convey this story. Um, and that happened to be this group of people that you got. Um, I think it's incredible. I, I highly recommend it to everyone um, to, to give it a watch because it's just, it's a world that, I mean, I grew up on a farm in Arkansas. I know nothing about that world and i think that one of the things that's happening right now in in cinema and television being able to tell these stories about people does help with the acceptability you know i'm a straight white male from arkansas i i've never had these issues i've never had any of those the things that they have to think about and i'm curious what it's like for you to be able to help tell those stories to help support people like Ryan Murphy who continually get these stories in front of people. It's a privilege. I mean, listen, the great thing about what I do is that every time I work on a project that's outside of my own life, it's like a I get to go into a fast-paced graduate program in what is an entirely different world and I get to live in it and learn it and then um, do my best to help it be portrayed. I mean, I've done that many times, and this was another example of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's absolutely a privilege, but it's also really interesting and fun and um, life-expanding in um, so many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's what makes this life and this craft so interesting. I mean, I worked on a film last year called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And, you know, I went into totally different worlds and worked in um, Malawi. And um, it's a true story. And I learned so much about different culture than my own. And, you know, again, this is this is what's great about what I do. To fully, like, explore these different worlds that are not your own. And to, yeah. to, and to really that. understand it and then figure out how to as I, you know, I keep saying how to sort of people these, the script that you're given, how to people it properly mm-hmm. once you understand these worlds. So one of the worlds uh, that I love, love that uh, you were a big part in helping create was Generation Kill. Um, Me too. It's, it's so, so incredible. I wanted to go to the military when I was in high school, but because I had a back surgery and have some metal in my spine, I was disqualified. But I feel like I would have been like Iceman, how much he loved it, how much he was into it. Um, and I guess I'm curious from, from that, how did you learn about that world? How, how did you imbibe yourself into that to then be able to find these characters and to find uh, and populate people this world? Well, some of it is like anything you study. I mean, you, you read about it, and I had a lot of the real guys um, oh God, the character that Michael Kelly played, because he was still in the Marines and he talked to me a lot about, oh, okay. about the snipers and, and just kind of, and, and Rudy, you know, I, I spent time with these guys and so I could sort of get a sense, but I think that the writing also really, um, helped explain these characters, um, I mean, Colbert was very, very clear on the page. Um, they were very distinct. And, you know, the book obviously helped a lot. And I we created um, a huge board with all of the pictures of the real guys and their ages. Um, just a big board that sat across from my desk. 
mm-hmm. because there were so many guys and I needed to really get them in my head. Um, and then it's just something that sort of takes you over this understanding of what real military bearing is as opposed to actor military bearing. There's, a, there's difference. a difference. There is a difference. And, um, my great grand or my grandfather's a green beret. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a difference in somebody it, pretending and somebody who's is, lived it. One thing is effortless and one is really not. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, you just begin to sort of, you know, the, the more time you spend in it, the more you just are immersed in it. Mm-hmm. So is it, is it, it's, it sounds like it's a part of a bunch of different things. It's, it's having conversations with, in, in this instance, with the real people, um, which I was, I didn't realize that you, you guys had the access to a lot of these people, um, which totally makes sense because it certainly comes out in, in a lot of the performances. Some of the conversations that I've had with some casting directors, they don't, they don't go down that rabbit hole. They see what's on the page. They do that. I'm curious if, if there's things that you do outside of just reading the script and outside of, you know, how do you, how do you figure out that world of the wire? Is that something that, you know, was, were there conversations that you guys were having with real people? To kind of Not on the that? wire. You know, I grew up in Philly and I understood what was on the page. Okay. I mean, that sounds incredibly pretentious, but I knew what I knew what they were writing about. I understood it, and um, and if I hadn't, you know, David would have explained it to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, sometimes you go you, you go beyond what's on the page because you need to. You know, I absolutely did that with Pose and um, found my ambassadors into the ballroom world who were gracious enough to kind of take me in and let me learn more. Um, but I, I don't do that on everything. I do it if I feel I need to. And that's just something you understand for yourself when, when you need to know more and when you don't, I don't do it. If I don't, if it's on the page and I feel like I get it, then I just proceed. And what sort of things are you asking? Like when it comes to pose, uh, what sort of things are you talking to these ambassadors about and what sort of insight are you gaining from those conversations? It's too amorphous to, to be specific about. Sometimes you're just hanging out and things just emerge. I, I can't, you know, it, so much of what we do is about human behavior. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so sometimes it's just about exposing yourself to, you know, to a world and seeing what you garner from that. Mm-hmm. Experiencing it, finding the, the genuine nature of it. Um. So we're we're at about seven fifteen. I'm not sure what your day is like. Seven fifteen here, ten fifteen there. Um, I've got one more for you. We, we, can we get that one in? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, one last thing. We'll talk a little bit about the wire um, because I'd be remiss if we didn't. Um, there's a behind the scenes from the book of the wire where you mentioned that Idris Elba was up for a Fox movie that you were casting just before you cast him in The Wire. Uh, and you were said that it, it was frustrating that he didn't get it because of his tremendous presence. Um, how often, as a casting director, do you stumble across somebody who has that kind of presence, but because they're unknown, there's some sort of veto that comes down from above? You know, I think that probably happens I think that that was a different time and also it was a feature Mm -hmm. so I don't find that that happens very much in my career these days I feel like the opposite happens where we're we're creating wonderful opportunities for people who deserve it who aren't so well known Um, because you're more capable and more able to do that in the television world i think so yeah i think so i think that that was a very specific incident because it was a feature and and i don't work on as many movies um i mean i work on indies but i don't work on as many studio films so why is that the case in television i think it's always been true in television television creates opportunity television you know makes stars Mm mm-hmm 
and it's just a good proving ground for those people. Um, I think, I mean, there's, there's certainly more that we could get into with the wire, but I don't want to take up too much more of your day. Um, I, I really appreciate your, your graciousness in, in chatting with us today, but more so like, you're, you're extremely humble for <laughs> the incredible work that you've done, um, which is again, something that I'm finding with a lot of casting directors, but what, what I think is is happening right now especially based off the conversation that i had yesterday uh with these two who are kind of newer in the industry is that i think there's an aspect of screaming what it is that you guys do from the mountaintops and while still being gracious and and humble people need to know what it is that you guys do i definitely agree with that so let's get it out there let's share this Thank you, Alexa, for what you've done. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. I hope you took notes because I did while I was editing this one. If you want to find out more about anything we talked about in this episode, please check out our website, placingfaces.com, for all the links to our episode show notes. Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe, love heart, thumbs up, and share the show. Oh, and have you shared the show with your grandparents? They probably still don't understand what it is that you do, so maybe this will help. I also wanted to take a moment to thank my producer, Maria Perry. Without her, there would be a snowball's chance in hell of this show actually getting made. I really appreciate everything you do, and I think you should all know Maria. Blazing Faces is powered by Collaborator.com, a media production service connecting media professionals to companies, brands, and agencies, allowing you to scale up your production based on your needs. Video professionals find work and companies save money. So you want to be a casting director, but you don't know where to start. Well, today is your lucky day. Not only did you just listen to a full episode of exactly what it is that you want to do, but... You can also check out our partners, the Casting Society of America. They have introduced us to so many of our guests while serving as a hub of information about this branch of the film industry. To learn more about the society and what it takes to get into casting, visit castingsociety.com. Until next time, thank you so much for listening, and be well.